Welcome. This is the 2nd of June, 2023. It's documentation office hours. Thanks for joining. Topics that I'd put on the agenda, uh, 2.401.1 released, um, 2.401.2 uh, release is in four weeks. Chris is the release lead. Yep. Is it two weeks or four weeks? It should so release oh, oh, so candidate is in two is weeks. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I just got them confused because I have to get the, the draft set up body in two weeks. Right, exactly. So docs team needs to create the change log and upgrade guide for 2.401.2. Okay. internationalization pull request end of life notifications and may newsletters so ashutosh with you here and with chris here are there other topics you'd like to add to the agenda yep. Cheers, Doc. okay google summer of code yeah because like two projects are like directly related to docs so all right and so we've got the we've got the docker quick start project and we've got the alternative build process no let's call it what it is versioned documentation for the jenkins handbook yep. user handbook okay so any other topics you want to add google summer of code and ashutosh this is yours if i remember correctly isn't it yes good all right so let's talk to that one that seems like and if there are conversations we need on version documentation we can certainly have them otherwise i think we've got a meeting scheduled in 12 hours or so yeah we do okay any other topics that need to be on the agenda okay then let's take this one first so ashutas do you have questions or do you have topics you'd like to discuss uh, not right now. Uh, uh, Bruno just uh, recommended me to attend the uh, of, uh, office hours for docs uh, to get familiar with the team and how things work here. Okay, great. And are you comfortable with with the places where we're currently using uh, Docker in the Jenkins documentation and some of the terrible flaws of that of that? Yes, I am familiar with the documentation. Okay, great, super. All right. Well, we're we're happy to have you here, and Thank look you. look forward to your contributions. So, I am curious, how's your experience been in you trying to use Docker Compose uh, to make an easier way to set up Jenkins and and its agents? What's your experience been so far? Uh, for the first Docker Compose file, we decided to go with a simpler file uh, for better uh, beginner user uh, experience. So uh, I'm building a first Docker file right now. It's this on this week's bucket list. And I'm getting some errors and they are getting fixed. Uh, so I'm working towards it. First file, uh, Docker Compose file will be completed by end of this week, I think. Oh, good. All right. So would you like to show us a, a demonstration of the compose file? I would love to see it if you're willing to share it or point us to a repository so we could look at it and talk about it. Yeah, I would like to see it too. Wait a second. I'll share the link in the chat. All right. Thank you. I'm not a compose expert and therefore forgive me using you as an education as, as a point of education. No, I'm not that experienced either. Okay, so yeah, and this is the experimental repo for the project. Perfect. Okay, so 
using a modern version of Compose and the Jenkins LTS version running as that seems dangerous. I'm a little surprised you're choosing that one. What motivated you to choose user root? No, I, I, this is for, uh, I was just experimenting. So I ah. gave all the permissions. I was getting some errors, uh, especially with the SSH keys. I was using R RSA first and this was, RSA was not working. So that's why I get the error. And we used ED25519. Uh, that solved the error for keys. But we still don't know why the RSO is not working with uh, this. Ah, okay. Well, so in terms of documentation, I much prefer ED25519 keys because they're they are so much shorter text. Uh, yes. The document, the, the open SSH people say they're also more secure. <laughs> okay. okay, so, so, and now, now the and you're doing privilege true for the same reason i assume that hey while you were doing development work you you wanted to be sure that permissions yes, didn't to... get in your way yes yes that's the reason and now you've already got an agent configured does it actually work for you is this is this working successfully yes and uh, this one is working successfully that's why uh, i set all the things to root and privileged because of so I didn't get in my way. Great. This and so just for experiments right now, sure. we had. Ab absolutely. And and experiments, it's it's perfect that you're doing it this way. So this is the ED25519 private key. Yes. And this is the public key. And here yes. is your, oh, this must be your RSA private key. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, so, and, and I can, I, I am no fan of RSA public keys because of that scroll bar. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for using ED25519. That's a good choice. Yeah, but we also recommended ED, uh, ED2. I was using RSA, but I was getting errors because of RSA. So he recommended ED2. Very good. And now this one is using... Oh, oh no! I see. I'm looking at the wrong file now. This is your your current one that's that you're experimenting with. We had seen it's user root, privilege true, and and before we go to production, I assume those will be gone. But we have to be yes. sure we understand how how and what. Yes, uh, Bruno also uh, created a pull request. Yes, uh, yesterday, I think it was uh, eight hours ago. Good. Okay. But this is, uh, he said there are a lot of things in it, so I have to look into it. I haven't looked into it right now. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so I, I, I would, I would have hoped we didn't have to do that, but then again, I'm not sure how the host key operates in no, that the, environment. These are just ideas. He, we right. haven't, haven't finalized them. Yeah, good for him. Okay. So now, and in terms of generating the compose files, are there specific techniques you use to make those compose to create those compose files? Are there uh, are there tools that help with that? Right now, I don't know how Bruno created all these files uh, because he uh, opened the PR eight hours ago, so I haven't seen much about much what is happening in those files. Okay. And now I've, I apologize, I've lost myself. I'll just click that link again. Here we go, back to the, okay. All right, well, so this is, this is already encouraging because it looks like what one of the problems that we have in the demonstrations in the, in the, the samples that we create is we end up running things on the Jenkins controller. And that's yes. a bad, that's a bad pattern. So what you've done here is already reached past that problem so that we could now set the Jenkins controller to have zero executors and only run things on this agent. Nice. All right. Well, Ashutosh, thank you. Anything oh, else you want to highlight in terms of, oh, yeah. of how your experiments are proceeding? Experiments are... Uh turning out fine. I was wondering how the 
process of setting the documentation will go. Uh, that's why Bruno recommended to attend the meeting. Uh, the plan was to just see, uh, get familiar with the team with the first meeting and discuss about uh, documentation later when the Docker files are completed. Okay. Would you be okay if we spend a few minutes looking at the documentation together and talking about how how we might think it would it would change using a compose file? Yes, yes, of course. So so Chris and Meg, this is where you jump in and and give guidance as well, because the things that I like about so the compose file is one way to solve this horrible awful terrible experience of installing you, you never heard me say that oh, but okay yeah the I docker I install it. process here is let's see how many steps are in it right it's too many you've got to it's, you've got to do step one open up a terminal create a bridge network what okay yeah, and then yeah. then you've got to do run this monster terrible thing that turns on <laughs> that does does the docker in docker and then you've got to run this create a docker file that brings in the latest jenkins lts and then you've got to build it and then you've got to run it so yeah. we're already five horrible steps into this before you've even reached the post install wizard okay so my dream is that ashutosh's work will replace those five horrible steps with one command docker compose up and the file name ashutosh i know that that's a, a long ways off for you and i'm okay with it being a long ways off but that was my hope chris or meg do you have a different opinion on how we should how we should hope for this yeah i, I agree with what you said so it's a replacement of what we have right now good all right. Meg, any guidance from you in terms of of ways that we should look for making this this experience better? John mute, Meg. Yeah, Meg, you're muted if you're saying anything. Okay, she may be away. There, no, I was oh. just muted and then I couldn't find the microphone sitting here squirreling like a fool with my mouth. Um, and then is it going to be a similar process for Windows? So the Windows, <laughs> the Windows documentation today uses uses the Windows installer. Okay. And so that won't change based on what what Ashutosh is doing. But oh I maybe what you were asking was Docker on Windows. Is that what you were asking? Right. For, yes. we got it for Macs and Linux. So I think so. And I think if if we are if we are as if we are as lucky as I hope we will be, the Windows and Mac OS, the Windows Linux and Mac OS will actually become a single thing. Ah. Because you don't really have to be the only reason for the the differences between these is this exotic stuff with Docker and Docker. Right. And I am hopeful that Ashutosh in, in investigating can find ways to, to do that in a way that works with, with containers on Windows and containers on Mac OS and Linux. Now, the assumption for me is that in each of those three platforms, the container is actually ultimately running an, a, a Linux variant inside the container. And that's the default way that Docker CE runs on Windows, is it runs with Linux containers underneath. So, so Ashutosh, does that sound okay to you? Or were you assuming that you would have to do something somehow with Windows-based containers on Windows? No, I was also assuming that will uh, be a single file for every operating system. Great. So the, the 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 dream then, Meg, is that the on Mac OS and Linux section disappears right. and the on Windows section disappears and it just becomes This is how you do it. This is how you do it. And it's a simple command, Docker compose up and the the single file. Right. That'll be lovely. 
Yeah, that's the match. That's supposed to be Docker. You can run this. It doesn't matter what operating system you're on. You get in it and right. Well, and and this the thing we need here is and the, this that's the thing that Ashutosh is doing for us is creating a multi-container configuration. Right. So here's the agent container. Mm -hmm. Here's the controller container. And I suspect for tutorials there will have to be somewhere in here a Docker in Docker container or something that gives Docker agents to the controller as a, as though it were a cloud. And I don't know which of those it is, but, but yeah. that's, that's the, the, the likely destination we dream of first step. I would love to get rid of this awful, ugly things that are here. And then, then we can consider going further from there. Right. Very nice work. Um, I got some question about the Docker Compose file prepared by Ashish Horsha. It's like, um, I'm, I'm wondering if it's a good idea to put like, um, like under Jenkins, we start no as well. And also to add the, the SHM size to it. Oh, you, you, so Chris, I missed that. You suggesting restart? So a restart uh, so, setting? Uh, yeah, we start setting to set to no for the Jenkins controller. Oh no, why would you set it to no? That's interesting. I thought that it was typical that for Docker, I had to set it to restart some other setting. Now, now I've got to go look and see what it was, but I, I remember that I've got a setting in mind that says something about restart. I just don't remember what the restart setting is. Okay, we should look into it. Yeah. Okay, so here I've got let's see looking just a minute okay. so in lts with plugins and there is a docker underscore run this one okay okay so some here how i said oh yeah i set restart to on dash failure now that may be the wrong thing but for me it works mm -hmm. It lets me do a restart, and then the the controller comes up again inside. Okay, maybe we should add this to like for oh. now and test it. Mm. Sure. Yeah. So Ashutosh, have you had any experience with a restart setting? No, I haven't. I don't have any experience right now. I look into it. Okay, great. Good, good question. Okay, and also, how about uh, SHM size? Just in case, I, it, if it's not enough, but I think for, for this purpose, it should be enough. The default, so, it's, I think, I don't remember, like, the default uh, was less than 5 GB, so if we want more than that, we have to uh, add the SHM size. And so you said SHM size. So it's SHM underscore size. And then SHM. Second, underscore size okay and i'm not setting that so i must be okay with defaults but that's a that's a setting that can be controlled in the yeah. in the service definition inside compose yep. yep well that that would certainly give us a better chance of assuring that jenkins had at least a minimum now is shm underscore size defining the maximum value for it or the allocated value or um i don't remember because I, I did i did search for it a while back let me see so I should some size talk or compose let's find out so that's um that's basically just i think it's a max size of the dev uh slash dev slash as you can in docker container okay oh and this is interesting okay so so shm yeah because like we run into some problems with it for gitlab plugin when we're doing um the config for mac os ah okay so so this so okay so i'm not sure i i guess i need to read the instructions what shm size is okay so Belena talks about it as interesting. Okay, so needs more research. Uh, Ashutosh, you've got the uh, good question. Any other questions, Chris? No, just those two. 
All right. Excellent. Ashutosh, congratulations on being accepted and thanks thanks in advance for your contributions. Good luck with your investigation. Yeah. Thank you, Ash. Look forward to seeing the next stages. Exactly. Good work. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. All right. Thank so you. let's see. Uh, the questions we had were um, oh, I should embed the embed the link to Ashutosh's example because that way I could play with it later. <laughs> Okay, and then it was questions from Chris and Ashutosh. The recording of this session will be available on community.jenkins.io roughly 24 hours after we've done the meeting. So you'll be able to refer back to it. Um, so it was should we set shm underscore size? Needed it for GitLab plugin, right? Yep modernization so the gitlab plugin project because like otherwise it would just like drop like i mean that the instance we just drop by itself after a while for my computer anyways okay and then the other was should we set restart to and my question was should it be to on dash failure and yours was should we should be was it should it be on on failure or no yeah and i don't i don't know which of those is most correct i know that i've been very happy with on failure in my configuration and then questions from me and i think ashutosh already answered those it was uh should we have privileged true should we have user all in root and i think the the hoped answer the way ashutosh described it was the hope is no on neither of those but for now it's it's in his is his experiment his prototype yeah okay great ashutosh anything else you wanted to highlight there before we go on to other topics no not nothing else okay all right chris anything you want to note on the version documentation for the jenkins user handbooks mm, maybe we um the thing is i think we should like start talking with infra or gavin about setting up about how to how to um move forward with um hosting uh a first draft of the work to uh dark star jenkins io so and and so I was thinking we wanted some time before we would make it visible globally, but we would like a preview first. Yep. We, would it be okay if we have need we need to have a preview site yeah. configured so that we can see the site in action? Yep. And that may need coaching from Gavin Mogan. Good. All right. Okay. Or Jenkins Infra. And I, I think they may be able to help as well, but good. All right. Anything else on version documentation? Um, I think we are about to have like something to 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 show for in maybe next week, but um so I'll report back next week. Oh, good. Yeah, because like we're working on like moving to uh, images manually because it cannot be automated according to venting okay say say that again so what's what um, what is the images because they have oh. to be moved to the new structure so it's like the then like all the all the lengths would have to be updated one by one and that could be a like time consuming so it may take a week i see okay so and that's because of antora's different way of handling images or um, I think because yeah, the, the, and uh, and I think it's for into that like the way that the images are stored may be a little bit different because like right now, it's um, it's more centralized. But maybe in the future, it's a little, it's depending on module. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Know, so I'll, I'll I'll need to take a look at and this work to find out. Great. All right. Thank you. 
Anything else on that topic? Nope. All right, next topic then was the 2.401.1 change log and upgrade guide. And that's visible here. So here is the change log. And here is the upgrade guide. Oh, and, and there are two mistakes that we detected. I should note that, that's good. Um, Mark made two mistakes in assembling the change log that we detected while we were doing the presentation of the what's new in, in 2.401.1. Two, at least two items were already delivered in earlier releases. So I'll get those removed. Any questions or concerns on the LTS process or the the content of the of the documents? Okay. And so for two point four zero one point two, it'll probably be me creating it, but Kevin may be back in time to do do a revision of it. Thanks. So uh, Kevin returns returns June twelve. Uh, he may be able to, oops, let's put that in the correct location. Oops, Kevin returns June 12, uh, may be able to do the change log. Okay. Anything else on those topics? Nope. Oh, good work. Okay, next one is a victory. This pull request from Jeffrey Chen uh, came in two weeks ago or so. And what Jeffrey did was he brought back a stalled pull request that was originally proposing to take content from the internationalization instructions on the wiki page. And uh, this is something that was done all the way back in 2019. It was started. We did long series of conversations about it. Meg, many others have been involved. And we then said, hey, this is stalled. We're going to move it to stalled so it's not distracting us. <laughs> Jeffrey Chen brought it back. What okay. he brought back, though, was incomplete or not quite what, what I thought we should do. So I proposed some alterations to it. Jeffrey accepted the alterations and we ultimately deployed it as. Let's look at the page. And now here. So here we've got first pieces that international and localization, internationalization and localization is no longer work in progress this is good enough it's production all right developer tasks translator tasks both relatively short lists an entry for chinese localization still and pointer to how to configure intellij to make your job easier doing localization with links inside the page to more details then right next to it on the page is the crowding integration that alex brandis has helped configure and makes it much, much easier to translate plugin text from one language to another. So thanks to Jeffrey. Now, Jeffrey has continued and has made the next step, which is another pull request. And the next pull request will probably need the same kind of work on it. It's this conversion of administering Jenkins and Jenkins best practices. And the challenge here is that many of these things are already covered elsewhere, and we have to find the correct locations in the documentation to put them. And I'm not sure that Jeffrey's able to, to do that. So, so this really will require more, more work from, from those of us who have got some deep experience with Jenkins and its documentation. Yeah. 
Meg, is this one you want to take a look at it and document or and add some comments on? I or? would, yeah, I will definitely be interested in reviewing this one. Okay, I'm going to add you to it so that that way you know you can see it. Okay. No need to feel like it's oblig oblig that you're obligated to do it, but if you've got capacity to do it, this would be a great one. Bruno has gone through and made linguistic changes and style changes to to bring things up to our common way of doing things and jeffrey has already applied those changes so what you're seeing should be already first level first draft good enough to review okay and let's put a link to that one inside the okay so And let me, the point of this is to get any useful information from the wiki merged into the existing docs, right? Right. The goal is to, to take the content that's being proposed here and find the best homes for it. Okay. And, and that's, that's a structural question, not, not as much a content question, right? It's right. okay. We read the text and the text says this, and then we have to decide do we already have something that says this and if not where should this be put because i don't think we want a new page called administering jenkins no right we've already got plenty of pages like that so and and i suspect we don't want jndi environment entry so so there there are some things in here that are just flawed and right. we'll discover those as we're working okay but we're not going to talk about whether the split between management and administration is always sane, et cetera. That's beyond the scope of this, right? Well, it's what what I was thinking is let's find the right place to put this kind of content if it doesn't already exist. And if if it you feel like it belongs in managing or administering, I'm fine with that, admitting that we know that the dis the distinction between those two is flawed and imperfect right i right. mean managing jenkins why is admin why is there a managing jenkins page and then a system administration or a section and then so yeah, yeah. The, the those things are not terribly logical right but and it's always a problem because life Oh, wonderful, though. This should be good. Yeah, so, well, it's it's worth it's worth at least I think I think there is much to be done, much value to be gained here by going through it and identifying every every one of us who sweeps through this will find things that we can improve, things that we can do to make it better. Right. Great. Anything else on that that pull request from Jeffrey Chen? No. That's good though. No. All right. Then the next item I had was end of life notifications in Jenkins core. So this one is we've got a with beginning with Jenkins 2.407 we've got a warning that appears to users now if they are running on an operating system that will be end of life in the next six months okay. what that mean what meg oh i was just saying yay <laughs> yes exactly so if it it also announces an early end of life for red hat Lent, red hat enterprise linux 7 and its derivatives like centos 7 so that early end of life is because that thing is such a pain to support that we want to get it out of the Jenkins project sooner, as soon as we can. Yep. Now we've got the next step on this and the next step hasn't started yet, but we, it will be coming, which is container end of life. So this was operating system end of life. But we also have a problem that we need to be able to say container end of life. Oh, yeah. Where what we've got is, for instance, 
Um, there are some containers that we've got some containers that are done with Arch Linux. It's a low volume distribution. Um, we don't have anyone in the maintaining team that's interested in it. So it's not being maintained. And therefore, um, it's it doesn't make any sense for us to retain it. Right. But we need to, in some way, find a way to announce to the users, hey, you're using a container that we're going to stop updating or we've stopped updating. Uh, the other kind is, this one is already covered, CentOS 7 controllers, a controller container, or yeah, con these are containers, so controllers. And this one is already showing the uh, end of life warning because it's using CentOS 7. Okay. But we've got others, for instance, Alma Linux 8, that we think we want to end of life. And one way to do it is to declare the end of life and make it visible and tell people your migration path is to this other operating system. Yeah. Or to this other container image. Any questions on that one? Nope. All um, right. Oh, a, a, this may be a dumb question. It's off the top of my head. Is there going to be any attempt to record this historically? No, because we do end of life anyhow. This is just we're warning them, right? With like right. some people, someone at a year from now comes in and wants to know what happened, you know, what the path was out of CentOS 7 or something like that. So we, we don't do that, right? We don't need to do that. Well, actually, good good question. So as you're thinking about, so we're we're pointing people to this blog post for right now so that they have a reference to the dates and the and the plan. I've wondered, should we have an end of life table in the Jenkins documentation somewhere eventually? But I wasn't sure that that would be as helpful as as, as the version documentation, which will, give us a place that we can describe which platforms we tested with a specific version anyway. Right. Except that some, some history, because unfortunately users do not upgrade when we think they should. Mm -hmm. Right. And some lag a little bit and every once in a while, somebody comes out of the woodwork who is just, you know, 15 versions behind or something. I don't know, because the table would also be kind. I don't know, would it be a pain to maintain or maybe not? Because once it's dead, it's dead and that stays. You'd just become keep adding stuff, right? Well, and, and maybe this is something this is a topic to discuss with Chris. So certainly today we have let me describe what we have today. So today I'm going to note it this way, Meg. Should we document the tested um operating systems at uh jenkins release right so right. in the version and documentation should we we note the operating systems that were run through automated tests so in the packaging repository today, tests, container, contests, installs of all sorts of operating systems, Fedora 37, um, let's see, Red Hat 8, Red Hat 9, uh, Debian 10. And maybe what we want is some way of, of declaring, hey, here are the things that were tested so that when we have version documentation, we see that 2.401.1 was tested with this mix of operating systems. Chris, yeah. what do you think? As, a, as release lead, could you envision something like that? Or Yeah, I do. Because I think it's, it's kind of like what it's a baseline version of Java we're using for like Jenkins. It's similar in nature. So I think we should document it properly. Right, right. 
Yeah, and it's even Java versions, right? Because it's, hey, we're using 11 this and 17 this, and we also ran tests with 19 this. Yep, right. Good, interesting. Okay, good, interesting concept, Meg. I'm not entirely sure how to do it, but we've got something like it already in, well, let me show this page because I was just checking it today. In the Jenkins documentation, we have a page called choosing the version, a Jenkins version to build against. So yeah. this is guidance to a developer of what value they should set for their Jenkins.version in their POM file. Right. And it tells okay. them 2.375.4 or 2.387.3. Now, five days ago, those numbers were 2.361.4 and 2.375.4. This documentation knows when we release a new LTS and puts the latest LTS there, one back there and two back there. Okay. So something like that, we could probably extract the, con the, the tested operating systems from the packaging repository as well. Yeah. Good and idea. Rely. If somebody wants to know what it was a couple of releases ago, they can go back to those other release notes. Exactly. You don't have right. to give them a single historical textbook on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, see, I want I want the textbook, but I wouldn't know that I, I don't know that I'd want to have to write it and maintain it. Well, and that's the that's the the thing that I'm not especially interested in putting this kind of information or or the the operating system we test into the change log mm -hmm. right because for me that's that's d different than the features in the release but i guess we could consider putting it in the change log instead it just for me that that feels like not not of interest to most people they want it on one platform and theirs mm -hmm. good okay did that answer your question, Meg? Yeah. It'd be interesting to mention this to some of the other maintainers and stuff, see what they think about it, what they hear from, because what I'm sure, because they get called into the crazy cases where somebody's like three years behind, they haven't upgraded for three years and now they want to know what to do. Right, right, yeah. good, okay. Yeah. All right, anything else? Any other questions or topics? I've got one last item and then we can close. Cool. Okay, the May newsletter, I've got to do some writing for it. Um, and onward we'll go. Okay, I got a question for Ashutosh. It's like, um, have you guys like uh, for the project, for GSOC project, for Docker Quick Start, have you guys planned how to draft the documentation needed for the Docker Compose examples? Can you repeat it? I didn't understand it. Oh, have you planned like how to draft the, the like the background details? So it's like um, is there like any process in place? Like how do you review the like on top of the Docker Compose uh, files? So you you also have for for the documentation we have on Jenkins IO. So some passages too. So, so Chris, how, how I let me test to see if I think if I understand what I think what you're referring to is something like this where the yeah. where the lines in the compose file or the lines in the in the in the compose file itself have little bubbles that tell us this means this is that what you're saying it, it could be yeah it could be and uh and also it's like I'm just wondering if they have a process like so so Ashutosh can start like uh drafting uh, no, we uh, right now we haven't had uh, discuss anything like this. Okay, okay, cool. I'll check back later. Okay. Well, and and so the the idea that the compose for me the idea that the compose file would be self documenting is really really helpful. But the challenge with self documenting in the compose file is then it becomes mostly comments. Oh, and, I, I don't, I, I don't mean to document in the compose file. It's just to uh, document it for the Jenkins IO, because like we, we're not just using the Docker compose file for the examples. So there's like there's some background information behind it too, and those like Ashutosh may want to collect 
as he goes along and he don't he may not want to wait until the last minute to do it because then he may have forgotten like most of the details that's what i'm asking now i see so i think what what you're suggesting is there are probably assumptions that Ashutosh is making, and it may be good yeah. to capture those assumptions or background information. Yep. For instance, this this one, hey, temporarily privileged true, yeah, because why? we want it, but long term we don't want it privileged true. Temporarily yep. user root, long term we definitely don't want user root. That kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Okay, I I'll remember this and keep it in. Uh, to the bucket list of for ne our next meeting with Bruno, so we figure something out about this. Great. For Thanks, Ashutosh. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for mentioning. So the idea is some form of of running notes or uh, lab notes or don't forget this. Or I did this because to remember current decisions, right? Right. I Good. tried this and it didn't work. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The other the other cool thing about that is sometimes those running notes are a great source for an eventual blog post about here's this technique we didn't deploy all the way to production, but it works in some cases very nicely for this. Yep. Great, thank you. Anything else? Nope. nope. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, uh, recording. Everybody will be available uh, probably within 24 hours. Okay.